Hi everybody and welcome to this demonstration on looking at Amazon's Aurora database. So the Aurora DB is basically Amazon's proprietary database service that they're offering. It does offer, as you guys saw from the lecture before, some good benefits in terms of the other databases that are out and used by most organizations today. So let's take a look at what we can configure and how we can get it and get an Amazon Aurora DB up and running in AWS. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and navigate to the Aurora DB. It's currently located under databases or what we can do is go right into the RRDS which is the relational database service which is offered by AWS. Now since Aurora is offered as a managed service with AWS it is currently under the relational database service under which you can provision additional databases also such as the Microsoft SQL or the Oracle and so on. So what we're interested in is right now currently looking at the Aurora database. Now since it is Amazon's proprietary service as you guys can notice and if you have not done so before it's promoting it quite heavily within the aws platform for example right when you go to rds right on the top you see an ad kind of kind of an advertisement for amazon aurora letting you know what it what it is able to do uh, in terms of its benefits and allows you to create a database in aurora right here from the top as compared to doing it in some of the other databases which you are able to do below so what we're interested in is let's go ahead and take a look at how we can go ahead and create an Aurora database. So once you create a database, again, it takes the same screen as if we were to create a normal database. What we want to do is go ahead and select the Amazon Aurora. Now for most databases, if you're not familiar in terms of what is MySQL or MariaDB and so on, if you guys notice on the bottom, it gives you a quick snippet uh, in terms of the main benefits that each one of these databases offers and, and also a good indication of the pricing of what it will be charged. And it, these change based on if you select the different databases. Now keep in mind, if you are provisioning an Amazon Aurora database for yourself and if you're practicing, it is chargeable, so it does not. It is not included in the free tier. So please keep that in mind if you will be practicing and if you do want to provision an Aurora database, you will start getting charged for it. So what I want to do is go ahead and select Amazon Aurora. In terms of the addition, it supports multiple additions. For example, MySQL 5.6, 5.7, or the PostgreSQL. SQL compatible versions or the engines. So it depends which one you will be working with, it depends on again your organization and what kind of data you have, what kind of engine you've been working with, will help you determine which one you want to have it compatible with. So we're just going to go ahead and choose the SQL 5.6. I'm going to go ahead and click on next. Here I can specify various details for the Aurora DB. Now first I can define the capacity information. Now in terms of the capacity type, now when you choose provisioned capacity type, you basically manage the database instance class. When your database, so for example, workload changes, you might need to modify the instance class to provide the appropriate resources. Now you can choose the provisioned capacity, the Aurora Parallel Query Enabled, to improve the performance of the analytic queries. And when you choose a serverless capacity, you basically specify the minimum and maximum resources required for your database cluster. And Aurora is automatically going to scale up or scale down the capacity based on the database load. So it just depends on your management, how you would like it to be managed, either provisioned, provisioned with the parallel query enabled or the serverless. So again, with the serverless, you guys notice that the options below disappear because it is fully managed by AWS. Whereas for the provisioned and the provisioned with Aurora Parallel Query, you are responsible for the database engine. So it just depends again on how much control you want on your engine and how much or in comparison to how much ease you want in terms of administration. So if you do not have a full-time database person, it's probably preferential to do serverless so you don't have to worry about all of the underlying infrastructure in terms of the management. But again, if you do have a database person or a database team, then either provisioned or the provisioned with the parallel query enabled. So if you do the provision, we can specify the engine version and we can specify the specific class. And here's where we can pick and choose what type of server in terms of hardware we want provisioned for our service. So let's say I pick a DBR3 extra large. 
Another option is a multi-availability uh, zone. That's what AZ stands for, multi-AZ deployment. What it basically does, it creates a replica in a different zone, which, be, which is going to provide for the high availability and redundancy. You can opt out of this also if you prefer. But as a best practice, it's always good to have that extra redundancy in case something fails or in case there's a hardware failure, it's always good to have a read replica in a separate zone. Here's where we can specify the settings in terms of the database instance identifier, the username, and the password. After I specify all of this information, I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. Here are some of the advanced settings that we can specify for our Aurora DB. We can specify it had to have it launched in a specific VPC. Uh, if we have additional VPCs created, we can launch it within that specific one. And if you have a, for example, if you are going to be using an Aurora DB or any database for that matter, it's always good practice in terms of developing an architecture to have the database in a separate VPC or a separate virtual network, a private virtual network and away from the public one if you have any public facing resources. Additionally, you can also do the same thing for the subnet. Uh, and again, since I only have a default VPC, it's defaulting to a default subnet group. And the public accessibility. So here, if you do yes, the EC2 instances and devices, again, outside of the VPC that's hosting the DP will be able to connect. So it just depends whether you want it to be publicly accessible or if you do not want it to be publicly accessible. Availability zone, which specific availability zone you want this database to be launched into if you do no preference. AWS will randomly pick one of the availability zones within your region. Uh, kind of this, kind of like the same practice that happens with EC2 instances, right? Where it picks randomly, or you can specifically pick a availability zone. Here, you can specify either use an existing security group, or you can use or you can create a new security group specifically for this database. And some additional advanced settings in terms of the cluster identifier, the database name, and the port. And if you leave these default, it'll it, uh, what we'll do, for example, the default identifier is going to be used. And if you do not specify a data, database name, the RDS obviously is not going to create a database, and then you will have to do that manually after Aurora is provisioned. In terms of the parameter group, so the database parameter group is basically the configuration values for the engine that is currently being used. And right now it's currently the default one since Aurora is going to be a fully managed database. So it's basically the engine configuration properties. Additionally, we can also specify IAM roles, which again is identity and authentication management roles for database authentication, whether we can enable it or disable it so we can opt to choose to manage our database using credentials through IAM or disable that option. And again, that would be dependent on how you have everything set up within AWS. Encryption, we are also able to either enable or disable encryption. So if we disable it, obviously we don't have to specify any values. If we enable it, then obviously we have that master and uh, we have that master key and that private key, which is used to access our database. And all of that is managed through the key management service, which is provided by AWS. So here is the failover priority. So every replica that you do is basically assigned a tier, whether it is zero all the way up to 15 in terms of the priority. So what AWS is going to do is going to specify which read replica you want to take priority over. So if you have a main read replica that you are using or that you specifically make sure that it is it stays updated and is up and running. So you can specify in Aurora that you want, in case of a failover, you want to fail over the main database to this read replica and you can specify a tiering value here. Additionally, backups, you can configure backups uh, as frequently as one day or as infrequently as 35 days. So again, depending on your organization backup policies. Backtrack is again, kind of like what the name suggests is going back to a point in time uh, in a specific database. So if for example, you want to enable it or disable it, you can specify a backtrack. If you enable it, you have to specify a backtrack window and it supports a maximum of 72 hours. So you're able to backtrack up to 72 hours before that specific point in time. And then finally, monitoring through CloudWatch. So you can specify enhanced monitoring or disable enhanced monitoring. So enhanced monitoring just basically allows you to get some more insightful metrics in your database. So if your database is one of your primary business drivers, you wanna make sure that you have enhanced monitoring and you can have the granularity in terms of the frequency every one second if it's mission critical or every one minute if it's not that mission critical. 
And then we can also log our exports in the CloudWatch logs, and then we can pick and choose which specific log we want to log and monitor with through CloudWatch. Uh, and we can select either one or multiple ones, depending on, again, our preference. Maintenance, we can let AWS know to do minor version upgrades to the database instances or the database engines, or we want to disable it. So if our database use is dependent on that specific DB engine or DB instance, then obviously we want to disable it. If our work and our database work that we're doing is not dependent on the engine version or, or the instance version, then we can enable it to have AWS do minor upgrades. And we can also specify a selection window. So let's say if there is a upgrade that needs to occur, AWS will do it on a certain day and a certain time. And obviously we can select when our traffic will be the lowest. Now, and if we do no preference, AWS will kind of use its machine learning to pick and choose a day and time that, will, that has the least amount of traffic to apply this update. And then finally, deletion protection, very similar to our EC2 instances. When it's provisioned, we can have deletion protection to make it a little bit more difficult to delete our databases. We have to specifically go in and disable deletion protection and then delete it if we are going to be deleting it. And then we can go ahead and create our database. Uh, and our Aurora DB is going to be launched. So it's essentially, these are all of the configuration options that we can select to have a fully managed Amazon Aurora DB. So essentially, these are all the options we can specify to have a fully managed Amazon Aurora DB up and functioning in our AWS ecosystem.